Chitral, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure being here. And uh, yes, we are traveling to the Canary Islands, and uh, I've been working in the Canary Islands for some, well, over 20 years by now. And so I'm going to give you a little summary on uh, the different islands in the archipelago. And then we're going to look at the geological origin. There is, of course, as always in science, there's a bit of a debate, and I'm going to introduce you to that. And hopefully I can convince you that one side of the debate is better than the other. And uh, then we're going to look at some geological highlights in the Canary Islands. Now, I should stress, geology is often... Well, some people don't think it's very exciting. Personally, I disagree entirely. I think it's super exciting, and particularly when volcanoes are involved. So today, I'd like to introduce you to my style of geology, and I hope you will enjoy that. So, origin and geological highlights of the Canary Islands. And, well, we're here in this part of the world, just off the northwest African coast, soon at least, and... Our goal is to reach the Canary Islands, and there's seven major islands in the archipelago. Recently, a small island, La Graciosa, has been given the title of the eighth Canary Island, and so officially, at least, there's eight Canary Islands, but in reality, it's only seven real islands, if you ask me. So here's the map of the archipelago, and in the eastern part, we have Lanzarote and Fuerteventura, in the central part, we have Gran Canaria and Tenerife. And then in the western part, we have La Gomera, La Palma, and El Hierro. And um, these islands are about 150 to some 500 kilometers off the African, northwest African seaboard. And uh, there's, of course, some connections to Africa, but they're maybe not as strong as some people like to think. So maybe I should stress here in the lower right, I have a little image, and that's actually a satellite image from NASA. And it's not particularly visible, but just about here you see the North African coast, and here's the Canary Islands. And you see this huge dust plume coming from the African coast. So quite frequently we have these dust storms. Kalima, it's called, the African winds, and they bring over a lot of material from the Sahara, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, and you will see the influence of these dust storms. It's very strong in the eastern island, a little less strong in the western islands. So, but I'm going to introduce you now to all the seven major islands on the archipelago, and we start with Fort Ventura, and uh, it's a very shallow island. It's only uh, got a highest elevation of 800 meters approximately. It's got 116,000 people living there. Population density is rather low with about 70 per square kilometer. I should stress the UK has a population density of about 230 people per square kilometer. Sweden, where I live, has a population density of 24 people per square kilometer. So, as I said, it's very shallow, and um, in the center of the island, because the island is deeply eroded, the mountains have been stripped away by millions of years of erosion, there we see some older rocks that go back to the Cretaceous. We see some very old sedimentary rocks. This is these stripy rocks down here, and they are actually materials shed from Africa. We see that in the core of the island, and I'll mention this again a little later. So I mentioned the dust storms, the Kalima storms. Maybe you can see it a little better here. Here's the African seaboard. Here is Fuerteventura and Lanzarote. Here's Gran Canaria. Here's Tenerife, very small on this map. And there is a lot of material blown over from Africa. And this gives Fuerteventura some of the nicest beaches in the archipelago. This is not sand from the islands themselves. It's actually imported sand that comes by wind transport. However, the wind transport is not always nice. I should stress, once we have these dust storms, it's really rather unpleasant. The particle density in the air is very high. It's very hard to breathe. And uh, here we have an image from Tenerife during one of those dust storms. And you can see the red haze. And uh, here you see this dust cover on the cars. And when it starts to rain on top of the dust storms, we actually get what's known as blood rain. It's this red kind of rain. It's very unpleasant. And in some places, we have rather thick layers of this dust 
that comes from Africa, red dust, very typical, and this is not something um, that the canaries have produced themselves, it's an imported type of material. So these dust storms, they originate here in the Sahara Desert, because the Sahara has a lot of dust, as you can imagine, and depending on the winds, some of the dust is blown all the way to the Amazon and to Central America. Another kind of highway, dust highway, if you will, is going to Miami and uh, all the way into the southern United States. And if you're kind of uh, having a wind that comes from the south and the dust can be blown up all the way to Europe, Spain, France and even the UK. And uh, I don't want you to focus too much on the details, but I have a little article coming up just now. And um, in there, I analyzed the minerals in the dust. And uh, the main mineral in the dust is actually clay mineral, tiny little flakes of platy material. And they, well, they're transported very easily because they are so platy. And this is the main mineral fraction. And there's a bit of quartz in there as well, a very, untypical mineral for the Canary Islands, but very common in the Sahara. So now let's go to Lanzarote. Lanzarote has um, also only a very shallow elevation, 670 meters. Population is 150,000 people, and the population density is about 180 people per square kilometer. And Lanzarote is famous for the 1730 eruption, the Timan fire eruption, and it's also famous for this way of growing wine, the Lageria way of growing wine, and I'll talk about this in a minute a little more. So there are some beautiful uh, little mountain remnants on the island, and there are some large lava fields as well. Here's one of the 1730 lava fields. There's still an active uh, salina where salt is made in an old volcanic crater where water is allowed in and then it's shut off and then the water will evaporate creating salt and nowadays we mine salt in different places but up to about a hundred years this was a very common way of making salt and uh, the Salinas on Lanzarote have been very famous for making a lot of salt for the Spanish Empire. So the way of growing wine, well there's this intriguing story, I'll talk more in a different lecture about this. Uh, in 1730, a big eruption occurred on the island and uh, most of the people were evacuated from the island because of the unpleasant eruption. And the king of Spain sent uh, Bishop Davilla to observe the phenomena. And the bishop came and he looked at the eruption and he looked at the socioeconomic disaster, but he noted something intriguing. He noted that wherever volcanic ash is on the fields and it's very thick, all the plants will die. But when the volcanic ash is very thin, the plants will actually sprout and uh, they will flower. And uh, so he recommended that a lot of volcanic ash is used for the fields. And after the eruption, people have cultivated these areas where volcanic ash is spread out and they built little walls to protect the wine um, against the wind. And therefore, they can actually cultivate a rather barren and rather dry island. And this has been very successful. And within 50 years after the eruption, the population on Lanzarote had actually doubled because of all the crops that could be grown as a result of that. So the Timonfaya National Park, the 1730 eruption, well, as you can see, this is a, a wasteland, so to speak, a mal país, as the Spanish call it. And uh, here, nothing really grows unless you really put effort in. And uh, another important feature of Lanzarote is César Manrique, a local artist, and he made many sculptures, but he also tried to integrate art and architecture with a landscape. And uh, if, we have a, if you have an opportunity, I would recommend try to look at some of his work. So he used lava tunnels, for example, like up here, and he created swimming pools in there, or this rather famous artwork where he uh, simulated lava intruding into a window, and it's quite famous. So, now Gran Canaria, we will not go there on our trip, but it's one of the larger islands, and it's uh, a little taller as well, almost 2,000 meters, and it's got a population of 850,000 with 545 people per square kilometer. That's double the population density to the United Kingdom. 
and um, the geological history of the island is rather varied. We have a lot of young volcanics, meaning over the last few thousand years. They are in green and they all occur in the north east of the island. And then we have much older rocks here, the pink and blue colors. They occur in the southwest of the island and they go back to 14 million years. So the other intriguing aspect is the north is very lush and very green. There's a lot of vegetation and the south is really desert-like. So here we get some impressions. This is from the southern part of the island, it's very mountainous and desert-like, and in the north, Las Palmas, the capital, there everything is a lot more lush. And here we have a little volcano, and this is in the northwest of the island, and uh, the local people on Gran Canaria call it Little Teide, because it's got the shape of Teide volcano on Tenerife, which is the tallest of all volcanoes in the archipelago. A famous place on Gran Canaria is the Rocca Nublo monolith. This was uh, worshipped by the Aboriginal population, the Guanches, and uh, this is an erosional remnant sticking up, standing proud in the center of the island, and this is one of the highest points of elevation on the island of Gran Canaria. The Aboriginal people that lived on the island, they left a lot of time documents in uh, particularly Gran Canaria and Tenerife, and there are several places. There's an old hill fort here where the Guanche people try to defend their way of life against the Spaniards with some initial success, but ultimately uh, they could not prevail. And uh, there are several settlements that have been preserved. And here's an ancient grain store that uh, was used by the Guanche people. It's all dug into volcanic rock, and here's some uh, carvings, some rock carvings that are believed to have uh, or had some ritual meaning at the time, but we don't quite understand the meaning these days any longer. So there's a lot of uh, um, caves that have been used by the Aboriginal people, and in those a lot of pottery has been found and ancient tools, and on Gran Canaria the civilization of the Guanches was most highly developed with uh, little kingdoms and uh, quite a sophisticated society prior to the arrival of the Spaniards. But all of this civilization collapsed after the Spanish conquerors arrived and within only a few decades there was very little left of the Guanche civilization. Now, Tenerife, we will go to Tenerife, which is uh, the highest, or has the highest elevation in the archipelago, with 3,718 meters above sea level. That's Teide Volcano, and it's got a population of 917,000 uh, people. It's the largest population of all the islands, and it's got a population density of 444 people per square kilometer. And uh, Teide Volcano, because it's so tall, it's been a very important navigational landmark. And this is an old Dutch drawing going back to the 16th century. And uh, here we see Tadis Peak standing out above the clouds. And uh, this has been very useful for sailors coming uh, down from Europe along the African coast because it was visible so widely and therefore it was a very useful landmark. There has been a lot of scientific discoveries on Tenerife, and this is an old drawing from the year 1799, and it uh, shows the eruption of 1798. And uh, here we have Teide Volcano in one of the earliest touristic postcards, and the big Orotava landslide valley over which Teide is towering. So here's a few impressions. You see Teide Volcano above the clouds, above the sea of clouds, as Humboldt called it. And uh, Teide is quite an impressive mountain, also the tallest mountain of, in, in all of Spain. And it sits right here in the center of the island. So this is Teide National Park. It's one of the most popular national parks in all of Europe, with over 4 million visitors a year. And it's got a, a rather magnificent landscape. If you have a chance, I really recommend you go there. There's also a cable car that takes you up, Teide, so you can actually go up there with a Swiss-built cable car, and it brings you up to an elevation of about 3,500 meters. The last final bit, you have to go on foot, but you need a permit for that, I warn you but uh, it's free to go up to this elevation here, the little plateau. 
There is uh, one particular feature. This is the most photographed rock in all of Tenerife. It's called the Tree of Rock. And it's, again, an erosional remnant. You see the layers of the, the rock layers here. And uh, it's got a very thin bottom part and a thicker upper part. It's because the rocks up here are a little harder and the rocks down there are a little softer. So the soft ones erode preferentially. And sooner or later, this one will fall over. There's no doubt about that. But until then, it's uh, a feature that almost every tourist on the island takes a photo of, and that makes it the most photographed rock unit on all of Tenerife. This is the last Cañadas caldera in which Tate Volcano sits. You can see the caldera wall here. And just very faintly in the background here, you see Gran Canaria Island. And uh, there's a big scientific controversy about how this caldera formed. Different ideas out there, and if you're interested, I'm more than happy to discuss them with you. And uh, inside this caldera, this collapsed structure, either vertically or laterally, that's what the debate is about, there's this new volcano, Tate volcano, sitting right in the center of it. And as I said, you can take a cable car all the way up from the bottom of the caldera to the, almost the peak of Tate volcano. Now, the summit of Tate is rather magnificent. You have a little bit of sulfur and a little bit of fumarole activity there. So it is an active volcano, but it has not erupted in 1,200 years. So Tate is believed to be slumbering quiet, quietly, and uh, we have little indication that it will wake up. There has been eruptions on Tenerife, and I'll talk about this later, but they were all on the flanks of the island and not so much in the center. La Gomera, very briefly, it's uh, one of the smaller islands, highest elevation is about 1,500 meters, population density is really low, 58 people per square kilometer, and uh, it did not have any uh, volcanic activity in 4 million years, so it's believed to be volcanically extinct, and that means erosion takes over and makes a lot of deep valleys, and in these valleys, we see a lot of steep mountains and we have these spines of felsic rock and that means light colored rock, they stick out. These are the famous roques of La Gomera and some of them have these beautiful columnar joints, a bit like the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. And uh, here we have a map of La Gomera and all the red dots here are these roques, these standing up materials of felsic rock and they are rather famous and they also had some cultural and religious importance for the original settlers, the Guanxi people of La Gomera. And uh, here we have some of these wonderful columnar joints for which La Gomera is also famous. Here a few more impressions and of course these are former volcanic intrusions. There's magma that got stuck within the volcano and uh, this material is harder than some of the surrounding and this makes for these rocks to stand proud now after the material around has been stripped away. El Hierro, um, <clears throat> this is also one of the small islands and we will not have a chance to go there but um, it's got a very low population density, only about 40 people per square kilometer, and uh, with about 10,000 people only. And uh, it's very famous for a new concept that was introduced a few years ago. It's got one of the earliest wind hydro energy plants where wind energy is used to pump seawater up to a volcanic crater, and uh, then the water can be released, and by releasing the water, you can actually make electric energy, and uh, this is a self-sustaining system, and uh, it's been highlighted as a model for how the islands could actually supply themselves with relatively clean energy in the future. So, another important feature about El Hierro is the holy tree, the Garahoy. Now, this is an intriguing feature. Some of you might have come across this image here, which is a tree that produces rain. And indeed, the story is that uh, when the Spanish conquered the island, they pushed the Aboriginal people into the mountains, hoping they would starve and die of thirst in the mountains. But the Guanxi people had a little trick up their sleeve, and that was the Garahoy. It was a tree that was standing on an impermeable horizon of soil, and the tree was catching the, the, the clouds, and there was uh, a lot of water being produced because of that, and it would drip down into this 
pool of impermeable material, and there they had, if you will, a spring from the heavens. And this is what allowed the Guanxi people to survive uh, without having a direct river system or a lake system in the mountains of El Hierro. So this is the holy tree, and if you come across this legend, it's actually true. So La Palma, well, La Palma is uh, one of the most westerly islands. It's got a pretty high population density, 116 um, people per square kilometer, and with more than 80,000 people living there. And uh, La Palma was in the news because of the big eruption last year. There was uh, an eruption that was probably the largest historical eruption uh, on the archipelago. And there was a previous eruption in 1971 and one before that in 1949. But last year, this was very intense because uh, nobody died, but it was a socioeconomic disaster. It was uh, a huge financial burden and thousands of people had to be evacuated. So I will have a lecture just on the La Palma eruption when we are close to La Palma. But uh, this is the active volcanic ridge, the Cumbre Vieja. And uh, there's an older part to the island, but this is where all the volcanoes are. You can see the vents here. And the eruption last year was in this part of the island. And this is actually a very um, rich, fertile area and with a high population density. This was a key reason for the disaster. The island has this ridge that continues submarine, so the island is growing towards the south. So in, geological, um, in the geological future, we expect the island to grow in that direction. Now, here's a few impressions. This is a photo from the 1949 eruption, the 1971 eruption, and this is from just last year. The good news is these eruptions are all very similar in style and that allows volcanologists to make some good predictions. And uh, this has uh, created a situation where the warnings were so good that nobody really got injured in the eruption. But uh, close to 3,000 houses and utility buildings were destroyed, and 8,000 people had to be evacuated. Some of them are still not back in their homes to this day. So here's a few impressions of the 2021 Cumbre Vieja eruption. And uh, this is from the very early days of the eruption. And you see a fracture, a fissure opened up, and magma was spewing out and devastating all the lands below this towards the coast. Now, but having said this, I want to explore a little bit about the origin of the Canary Islands now. And this is an old image from the 1600s by Athanasius Kircher. And he was trying to work out how volcanoes actually work. And he pictured this ocean of fire inside the Earth. And then he assumed that these fires would come out and they make volcanoes here. So does this have anything to do with the canaries? I actually believe so. But let me give you a little bit more evidence. Now, an important observation is that the smaller islands in the archipelago are all on the western end. So here we have El Hierro, here we have La Palma and La Gomera, and Tenerife is much larger. There's a new little volcano growing, Las Hijas, it's underwater, it hasn't yet reached the uh, ocean surface, but it's believed that it's growing as well. And uh, it might make a new island. So if we look at the distribution, what we see is that there's the small islands here in the west, and then we have these tall, big islands in the center and the very flat islands here in the eastern part of the archipelago. And uh, some people want to draw it with vertical exaggeration and then it looks like this. We have these huge kind of steep volcanoes here in the center and then we go very shallow and there's actually some volcanoes underwater, which I haven't talked about, that are going further towards the northeast. So there's a whole chain of islands. And um, this is very important for explaining the origin. So there is this change with the young volcanoes here in the west and the old flat islands here in the east and the big islands that have grown to full size in the center. The idea is that the island chain is growing towards the west and uh, that the islands in the east are much older and they have already been deeply eroded while those in the western part, they're young, they're kind of juvenile volcanoes if you will and they are growing small islands now that likely will become bigger as well with time. 
So, and uh, this is consistent with uh, some ocean bottom work that has been done by oceanographers. And what we found out is that the islands in the east, they sit on older sedimentary rocks than the islands in the west. They sit on younger rocks, so there's good indication that the islands in the eastern part have formed some 20 million years ago, while the islands in the uh, western part have only formed about one million year ago. So there's an age progression throughout the archipelago. And uh, the oldest rocks we find on Fuerteventura are 20 million years old, while the oldest rocks we find on El Hierro and La Palma are 1 to 1.7 million years old. So there is a huge age difference here between the islands, the eastern ones being pretty old, the Western ones being just very young. Now, there is a big controversy about the origin of them and how these islands form, but I should point out the African plate is actually moving, but it's moving very, very slow. It moves with about two centimeters per year. That's about the speed with which your fingernail is growing. So it's a very, very slow process. And uh, it's believed that there's a stationary anomaly deep inside the Earth that produces hot magma, and the plate is moving above, and that gives rise to a chain of islands over the millions of years. So I should point out that um, the controversy goes a little further. It's much more sophisticated, actually, and that is that some people think there could be a fracture underlying it rather than a moving plate. And I should point out that the islands here have very peculiar shapes. Islands that form on fractures like the Azores, they tend to be very long. This is not what we see in the Canary Islands. So this argues against the fracture concept. And fractures in the ocean floor, like here around the Azores, they produce loads of earthquakes also here. This is the North African seaboard. This is the Atlas Mountains. Here's a plate boundary between Europe and Africa. There's loads of earthquakes, very few earthquakes in the Canary Islands. So the idea of them forming along a plate boundary is not substantiated. And we have a slightly different model, and that is that the rotation of the African plate allows, well, this magma anomaly, like with a Bunsen burner, burn little islands, little holes into the crust, and that makes the little islands, and therefore we have an age progression, and we can see the rotation. Indeed, we don't only see that for the Canary Islands, we also see this for Madeira. So there is a rotation pole, in geoscience we call it an Euler pole, and around which the African plate is rotating, and the island groups seem to follow this trend rather neatly. So this is further support people have done, geophysicists have done seismic tomography. They're sending seismic waves deep into the earth and there they see potential anomalies. And here's the Canary Islands and we see a deep anomaly under the Canary Islands as well as under the Cape Verde Islands. So here it's a little larger and that implies that the magma is coming from very deep. It's not just a surface fracture, it's a deep melting anomaly inside the earth that feeds the volcanoes of the Canary Islands. So let me bring you to this little sketch and I hope I can make it work now. So here we are. So the idea is that the plate is moving very, very slow and uh, we have this steep melting anomaly and it produces one island after the next. The plate is transported away from this hot spot from this plume of hot material, and this gives rise to a series of islands from Fuerteventura all the way to La Palma and El Hierro in the eastern part. And uh, this is a very similar model to the Hawaiian island chain, and uh, it's believed to be the explanation here. Now, coming back to Athanasius Kircher and his idea about how the Earth works, this is the modern view of how the Earth works, and uh, here we have an inner hot area inside the planet and material is rising up. And here's Africa, and I think I have a rotation for you there. This is Africa down there, and I've just flipped the map around now. Now Africa is here, and indeed we have this melting anomaly coming up. 
it's not so different to Athanasius Kirche, I find. So we have come a little further in the last few hundred years, but some concepts haven't fundamentally changed. Now, I'm going to close in the last few minutes here with the key geological features of the Canary Islands. And I'm going to show you a few impressions about what people call rift zones and giant landslides. This is a peculiar feature of the Canary Islands. There is these really enormous landslides, and I'm going to present you with some evidence for those. We're then going to look at some lava tunnels or lava tubes, and uh, I will close with a summary of the recent and the historical eruptions in the Canary Islands. So, this is the island of Tenerife, and uh, you might have spotted it. It's got three major arms. El Hierro, the island of El Hierro, has also three major arms. Some people call it a Mercedes star pattern, and um, these three arms are symptomatic for some of the Canary Islands. They're not elongated along fractures, but they form these rather peculiar shapes. And uh, this has puzzled geologists for really decades. How do they come about? Well, an important observation is that each time we have one of these triple-armed patterns here for El Hierro, here for Tenerife, but we also see that on some of the other islands, like here in uh, La Palma, and it's also seen on Hawaii, for example, but maybe less pronounced there. We seem to have rift zones as well, but the important feature is there seems to be landslides in between these rift arms. So the islands seem to fall apart. There's these giant embayments in between these rift arms, and uh, they produce large offshore deposits of material that, are, that has fallen into the sea, literally collapsed um, part of the island into the sea. So here we have a little picture of the northeast rift zone viewed from Teide volcano over here. So we're looking this way here into the northeastern part of the island. And there is a big embayment, and this is a former landslide embayment. This particular landslide happened about 500,000 years ago, so not very recent. It's quite some time ago, but it gives shape to the island to the present day. Here, we can now look at Teide Volcano from the northeast. We're now exactly at the other end of that system, looking towards Teide Volcano here. And there we have this large ridge, and there's this landslide embayment I pointed out. And there's another one just here in uh, the northern part of the island. So several of these large collapsed areas are still present, are still visible today. And this is also the case on La Palma. You can just about see there's a big chunk of the island missing, and there was a big landslide about 500,000 years ago. And now, since then, the island has grown towards the south, and there's a big discussion amongst some geoscientists. Will the island collapse again? Some people speculate this part of the island might actually collapse into the sea. I'll say a few more words about this in a few minutes. So, La Palma is the volcanically most active island on the archipelago, and there was eruptions in 1646, 1677, 1712, and then in 1949, 1971, and in 2021. So this is uh, the uh, fracture that opened up during the 1949 eruption, and this is the origin of that speculation that the island might collapse again. This fracture opened up during an eruption, and it has given rise to a lot of consideration about the stability of the island. So here you see the 1949 lava flows on this map, and there is another one that went this way. There were several vents that erupted in 1949, and this area here is considered to be unstable. And this is where this fracture came in. This fracture is found in this area here. And people speculate this might actually produce a giant landslide in the future. The good news is people have measured this for the last 20 years. And even during the 2021 eruption, no movement on the flank of the volcano. So for now, at least, the island seems stable, which is very good news for us. In the geological future, well, we have no guarantee. We cannot tell. 
But for now, there seems to be no risk about a giant landslide on La Palma. So, these giant landslides, we see them on all the islands, even the old islands have evidence for these landslides. It's a typical feature of the Canaries. We cannot make this go away. It's a reality. So these landslides do occur. And this is not just typical to the Canary Islands. We also see that in the Hawaiian Islands. There's many large landslides coming off these islands. And they are the reason for these triple arm drift zones. Chunks of material are breaking out, falling into the sea. And what's often left seems to take the shape of three arms, three main arms that make the rest of the, the remnant of the island. So the rift zones on El Hierro are particularly nice here. Here we have these three rift arms, but we have giant landslides here. That's the El Golfo landslide. That's the El Julan landslide. And here the San Andres landslide with a major fracture system. And all of these are landslides. So here we have one of the tallest cliffs in Europe, the El Golfo cliff on El Hierro with 1300 meter of sheer cliff. And all of this material here has fallen into the sea. Over there, we see La Palma Island in the distance. This is the El Julan landslide on, um, on uh, El Hierro as well. Here we see the kind of uh, outline of it marked with a stippled line. This is a little older. The El Golfo is a little younger. And uh, the San Andres one is this one here. So each side of the island has experienced a major landslide. And here at San Andres, the village of San Andres, we even see a major fault line. You can really put your finger on the sliding plane. Quite fascinating for geologists. So here, my former PhD student, Marc Antoine, and myself trying to get a sample from the fault plane. So here you see the striations. This is where a landslide has really gone down and probably several hundred meters of uh, movement on that fault plane. So here we have very strong evidence for landslides being a reality in the Canary Islands. And uh, this means we have to think about it for the future. Oops, let's go back. Coming to Tenerife, there is this large caldera, the Las Cañadas caldera, with Tate volcanoes sitting in between. And likely, this was also a large landslide. But this landslide was several hundred thousand years ago. And again, Tenerife has also had no major instability in the recent <laughs> geological history. Gran Canaria has a giant embayment here in the northwest, and uh, this is the embayment. When you look at it on the ground, we sometimes refer to it as the bite in the apple uh, with Gran Canaria, well, resembling the shape of an apple, and here's a big bite in the apple. And again, this was also a chunk of the island collapsing. And when we go to some of the older islands here, um, Fuerteventura, here's the Jandina Peninsula, and this has also the shape of a giant landslide. So all of these uh, islands, they grow very rapidly and they partly collapse. Now, here's the big controversy, and uh, maybe some of you have seen the various television programs. I was part of it myself in a National Geographic program a few years ago about what would happen if a giant landslide would occur today on the Canary Islands. Well, we would make a big splash in the ocean, wouldn't we? And it would likely be so big that it would create a tsunami, a giant wave. And I don't know ent entirely whether it's true, but some people have done model calculations. If the island of La Palma would have one of those giant landslides today, you can model the progression of this ocean wave. And it's believed that after nine hours, the ocean wave would actually reach Florida. Now, is this realistic? I can't tell, to be honest. If the models are correct, then that would be the result. But we don't know whether this giant landslide would happen all in one go or whether it would go down in small pieces, because then it wouldn't be quite so severe. Luckily, as I said, we have no instability signals right now. So for the next decades, at least, there is no worry. But in the future, this may well happen. So a tsunami is very likely, and there's evidence in the Canary Islands that this has happened in the past. We have tsunami deposits. That's 
rocks made of shells and beach boulders that we find high up in the mountains. And this is what ocean waves have transported high into the mountains of some of the islands. So, therefore, some of the newspaper reports about uh, some of these catastrophe tsunamis and uh, ocean waves traveling all the way to the Americas, they are geologically not unrealistic, but they're highly improbable right now. The probability is very, very low. So, a few words about lava tunnels. Uh, the Canary Islands are very famous for these lava tubes or lava tunnels, and uh, they are rather spectacular. So, uh, there is quite a number of them on virtually all the islands, and uh, not only have people hidden there, the local population, they hid there when there was pirate attacks, for example, but there's also a lot of animals that were living in these caves, and these caves gave rise to some very peculiar species. So uh, there is, for example, certain spiders and certain rodents that only live in those caves, and uh, that's, of course, very exciting. How do they form? Well, we know from Hawaii that uh, there is underground subterranean magma movement, and there's a hardened crust above, as you can see here, and some of these tunnels, they drain empty, and that's what makes these lava tunnels. You can still see the progress of lava down here by the striations inside the tunnels. So this is the idea. We have lava flowing. It forms a crust on top, and it continues to flow inside. It's like an insulation, heat insulation, and then the magma can drain out, and the tunnel remains. And as I said, there's quite some spectacular animals. So here, for example, there's a spider on Tenerife, and it's rather colorful when it's on the ground, but when you go into the caves, the same spider lives in the caves, only it's gone completely black there in order to camouflage because there's very little light in those tunnels and the spider finds it advantageous to not have color there. And um, when I kind of had my first encounter with those spiders, I wasn't too impressed, I have to admit. So, <clears throat> there's also strange crabs, for example, like this one here. And this one lives in lava tunnels on Lanzarote. And uh, this one has decided it's better for it to have no color at all, saves a lot of energy. So it lost all its pigment, and it only is found in these lava tunnels. And I should point out, some of these lava tunnels are used for architectural um, delicacies, like uh, concert uh, halls and restaurants that uh, have been, for example, built on Lanzarote. If you have a chance, do have a look. It's quite spectacular wonderful living spaces and uh, community spaces in some of these lava tunnels to this day. And uh, Cesar Manrique, he has been, uh, I mentioned him earlier, he has been a pioneer here. So here is one of the restaurants that was built in one of the lava caves following Cesar Manrique's design. In fact, he himself lived in a lava cave. So uh, this was something that he treasured very highly. There's a concert area, a concert hall inside a lava case. This was also designed by Cesar Manrique, and there's still events on this in Lanzarote uh, to this day. Now, the end of the lecture is to talk a little bit about the historical eruptions. There has been a good number of historical eruptions, about a dozen of them, and uh, these have not occurred on all the islands, but we have historical eruptions on La Palma, on Tenerife, on Lanzarote, and there was one offshore on El Hierro, but it was not onshore, so this is why the island is marked here a little differently. This is the 1971 eruption on La Palma. This is the 2021 eruption on La Palma. So this was probably one of the largest eruptions in the historical record after the 1730 eruption on Lanzarote. So here's a list of all the historical eruptions. We don't have to go into detail, but the first eruption, the first historical eruption, meaning documented eruption, was actually uh, documented by Columbus on his way to the Americas. He was sailing by the island of Tenerife, and he noted an eruption in the hillside. He didn't go himself, but it's an entry in his log, and he was quite smart about things. He said, his sailors were very worried, and he said, oh, sailors, you don't need to be worried, it's nothing unusual. It's very similar to Mount Etna in Italy, where I'm from. And so apparently he would manage to calm his sailors down, and uh, he reported the first eruption. 
on the archipelago that is documented. And of course, the youngest one is this one here, 2021 on La Palma, and a whole series of them in between. So let's look at historical eruptions on Tenerife. There is uh, the uh, 1705 eruption here that had several vents, three vents in fact, three very small vents. Then the 1706 eruption, then the 1909 eruption, the 1798, and as I just mentioned, the 1492 eruption. So very, very briefly, just a few impressions. I don't want to go into detail now, but this is the 1492 eruption. And uh, people have done analysis, and it's able to actually um, give a correct age for this eruption because of trees that were caught up in the eruption. And you can do the carbon-14 analysis. And uh, the carbon-14 analysis confirmed that this eruption must have happened around the time when Columbus passed. And it produced a nice little lava flow, and we can map the lava flow today. It's called the Boca Cangrejo eruption of 1492. And here's a few impressions of that. And uh, this is uh, just a few vents that are likely associated with that eruption. So the 1705 eruption produced a little hill up in the mountains. This is this area here and uh, the Fasnia events, and a very small eruption altogether. And there was a larger lava flow here in the Guima Valley, the Arafo lava flow, which didn't reach the sea, but it almost did. It went very close to the sea, but then it stopped. So here's a few impressions. The dark material is the 1705 eruptive material, but this area is completely uninhabited, so nobody got harmed and uh, nobody got hurt. This is the vent in the Guima Valley, and it was producing a lava flow that was coming down here, but the population density was very low at the time, so not a lot of damage happened. 1706 was slightly different. This was a very unfortunate event on Tenerife. There was a volcano forming up here. It produced lava coming down here in several tongues or lobes, and just at the bottom of the cliff was the port village of Garachico. It was the main port for the American trade. And uh, here's a painting, an oil painting from back in the day. And you can see the lavas entering the harbor basin. So this was the former harbor basin. And part of the harbor got filled with lava, which made the harbor basin too small for major ships and it actually had, uh, as a consequence, a major reorganization of the island's traffic system as a consequence. And this was quite devastating socioeconomically at the time. Although nobody got hurt, it was financially a bit of a disaster in 1706, and it led to the new capital being established in Santa Cruz on the other side of the island. The 1798 eruption, this is the eruption that uh, was quite famous in Europe and Humboldt heard about it and Humboldt was so keen to see it that he came a year later, 1799 was the uh, year Humboldt visited Tenerife, but uh, of course the eruption had stopped by then, but Humboldt did see the events and he went up to Tede, he even established the height of Tede as the first kind of researcher that had a real clue of how to do it and uh, here we see the vent system of 1798. And um, then the 1909 eruption, here again the vents of it, this is a very small eruption, it only lasted 10 days, again high up in the mountain, nobody got hurt, nothing got damaged, so a rather benign eruption and people were actually going there and uh, viewing the eruptive vent in 1909, here's one of the earliest photographs from that time. Now, I mentioned Lanzarote and the Timan fire eruption. The Timan fire eruption was a bit more of a disaster. Actually, a quarter of the island of Lanzarote was covered with lava after the eruption. Most of the island had to be evacuated. The eruption lasted six years. And this was a really unpleasant event. It was probably the most intense eruption the uh, archipelago has seen in historical times. But it led to... Um, the idea of using volcanic particles as a soil supplement. And afterwards, the island really grew rich on growing wine and all these kind of things. And uh, um, there, a lot of cereals were suddenly grown, even potatoes. So 
uh, from an agricultural point of view, it was a real revolution. But only after the eruption, of course. During the eruption, it was a disaster. And uh, here you see a little map. The red areas are the areas covered by ash and lava. So a lot of the island was unfortunately destroyed, covered. A whole series of villages were really drowned out by lava. And nowadays, they're digging into the lava. And you can actually see the remains of those villages that got covered with lava in 1730. And this is a wonderful time capsule for us today, studying that time. But of course, for the people at the time, it was a real disaster. So the Timanfaya National Park is the other big national park on the, in the archipelago. It was established in 1974. And uh, this is the Timanfaya National Park, named after the eruption, the Timanfaya eruption. And it's a large chunk of the island where you can't really walk freely. You can only go there with a guided tour or with a bus. And uh, some of the excursions are going there. And uh, if you have an interest in volcanoes, I recommend it highly. There's also the potential of doing a camel tour. If you're bold enough to sit on a camel, this might be of interest to you. So this is how it looks there, the Timon Faya area. It's like a wasteland, a volcanic wasteland. And uh, the uh, uh, authorities want to preserve this um, geologically important um, landscape and therefore you're not allowed to roam freely. You can only go there on guided uh, tours on certain paths and roads that are permitted. So this is kind of some impressions from this area here and uh, it's rather spectacular from a volcanological point of view. Another feature there is that um, the lavas bring up this mineral here and you will have the opportunity to purchase some jewelry or some raw materials of that. And this is the mineral olivine. It comes up in these rocks that we call Dunites after the Dun Mountains in New Zealand. And uh, it's a mantle mineral and it's a iron magnesium silicate. And well, some people believe it gives you special energies. I don't know about that. But, uh, well, maybe it works. So, it comes up in these nodules of mantle rock that are brought up by the lava. This is what the mantle, the earth mantle, is made of. It's got a lot of this beautiful little uh, mineral olivine. And when it's a gemstone, we call it peridot. So, and, uh, well, it's not too expensive, actually. It's rather inexpensive because there's quite a lot of it. And uh, the Romans used it already. Cleopatra loved it, apparently, because it's got a calming effect, so people say. So, you have to potentially have to have your own experience with it when you have a look at it, see whether you like it or not. But it's a beautiful souvenir from the Canary Islands. In the Timon Fire um, National Park, there's still remnant heat. There's still a, a geyser, and uh, there's hot air. And the local guides there, they throw some straw in it, and you see that it will ignite rather immediately. So still, since the eruption of 1730, there is still volcanic remnant activity. But there was a small eruption in 1824. After that, no more eruptions on Lanzarote. All of the other eruptions were in the western part of the archipelago. So, El Hierro, well, we talked about El Hierro, and there is a rift here to the south, and no eruptions on El Hierro itself, but on this submarine ridge, there was an eruption in 2011. And here's the village of La Restinga, and here on this submarine ridge, there was a small eruption in 2011, lasting for about six months, and it produced a little submarine volcano. And uh, here you see some of the material that has been bubbling up, and here there was a few kind of splashes in the water. But nobody got hurt, nothing bad really happened. Some rocks were floating on the ocean surface here. When they have enough bubbles and enough gas, then the rocks can float for a, a certain amount of time until they're completely water-soaked, then they sink again. So for some short periods, we had this rather intriguing phenomenon of swimming rocks. And it only lasted a few weeks, however, and then the rocks were gone. Now, La Palma, this is the last one in my list. There was a number of eruptions. Here's all the historical eruptions, making it the most volcanically 
prolific island in the archipelago. Here's an image from 1677 of an eruption. This was an eruption in the southern area. The southern part of the island is sparsely populated. The north is densely populated. And the new eruption was unfortunately in this northern part where loads of people lived. So here are some photos from uh, the 1949 eruption. And uh, this was mainly in this part of the island. And uh, here you see various lava flows from the different episodes, 1949, 1971. This is also 49, 1677. And here, the new eruption in red. The older ones are in orange. The new one here is in red. That's the 2021 eruption. Here's some impressions from the 2021 eruption. Vast amount of lavas were emitted. And there was a lot of settlements in the path of the lava. People were evacuated. Unfortunately, not all pets could be evacuated, evacuated. So some animals were staying behind, which was a bit of a drama. And there's a few rather intense stories about uh, pets that were partly rescued, partly not. And um, the devastation of agricultural land and settlements is, of course, unparalleled. So this is day one of the eruption. This is when the vent opened. And this is at the end of the eruption after 87 days. And within 87 days, this whole mountain grew out of nothing. Quite impressive. And here we see the volcano erupting. And here we see the lavas coming down. Here's a banana plantation. And uh, partly the banana plantation was swallowed by the lava. Partly it's still there. And here I went to exactly this boundary. Here we see the lava. Here we see the banana plants within a meter of each other. So this is really nature and volcano impacting on society as we know it. And this is me standing on top of the lava field looking towards the volcano. This is just an ocean of rubbly lava, meters thick, and it's still hot inside. So for years, there will be nothing you can do with that land. So this is, as I said, socioeconomically a real catastrophe. So, the eruption lasted for 85, some people say 87 days, 8,000 people were evacuated, uh, 2,800 buildings were destroyed, almost 1,000 hectares of plantation and farmland were destroyed, 70 kilometers of vital roads, including a major north-south connection, were destroyed, and uh, the good thing is nobody died, but the financial burden for the island is just, well, unbelievably high. So here is uh, my colleague Guillem, whom I saw in Barcelona. He works at the University of Barcelona. And the volcano is just here, you can see it. And here's one of the houses, almost completely covered in volcanic ash. So here I'd like to close, and I hope I gave you a good impression of the ge geology and the volcanology of the islands. And uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>